I'm Claudia Catania, and you're listening to Playing On Air. You are about to hear Hedgehog Years, a short play by Lily Ackerman, second prize winner of Playing On Air's inaugural James Stevenson Prize for Short Comedic Play. The cast features Jeremy Seamus, Tony-nominated actor of Clybourne Park and TV's Better Call Saul, and the legendary Carol Kane, who was Oscar-nominated for the film Hester Street and has given memorable performances in everything from Taxi to The Princess Bride to Netflix The Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. The director of Hedgehog Years, also known for her work as a multiple Tony Award-winning actress, is Judith Ivey. And now, Hedgehog Years. Theo, a young boy, is on stage alone. He tries to listen to the moment between two moments. The silence between the tick and the tick. He can't. All he can hear is the next tick and the next. Raindrops he can't catch. They follow him onto the school bus and through the hallway into the classroom. When he opens his cubby, he tries to distract himself by staring at the woodland creature stapled to the wall. He wishes he were a mongoose or a hedgehog. Something that forgets the tick, 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 tick. Each tick subtracts one tick from the sum total ticks of his life, ticking him closer to the day he turned six, seven, fifty and diabetic like his father, eating gummy worms on the sly. Isn't time supposed to be relative, contracting and expanding? When will it start to expand? The classroom rotates around the sun. His mom says he can't feel it rotating, but he definitely feels something. She says it's all in his head. Okay, so maybe it's his head that's spinning out of orbit. Feel them. They don't hurt. I'm not a porcupine. Feel. I have to pause here to clarify. Any words spoken by hedgehogs in this play are in translation. Please note that all translations are betrayals, and some betrayals are necessary. Like when your mom expects you to be home for Thanksgiving, and instead, without warning, you spend Thanksgiving in a grassy knoll. Common misconception. Once I went out on a date with this porcupine, and she was like... All I want is a salad, okay? I hope that's okay with you because it's all I want. I was like, whoa, someone is defensive. We had almost nothing in common. Hey, uh, d- d- do you mind if I j- just crawl into your bucket like... Yeah. Ooh, that's great. <gasps> He could feel the tiny claws of the creature digging into his thigh. Claws or teeth, either way, they were a comfort. The sharp points like anchors in the wilderness. They must have gotten his note by now. He left it in his lunchbox. Dear Mom and Dad, I had to go. I will be okay. Love, Theodore. Maybe they ate the lunch themselves. Maybe they ate the lunch and then decided to go out for drinks to celebrate not having to pay for a babysitter when they go out for drinks. You're enormous. I'm small for a human. For a hedgehog, you're enormous. I'm almost five. Yeah, in hedgehog years, that's like ancient. Want a worm? Don't you so much, just swallow. It was like sliding a little throat inside his throat. He had another. If this were a movie, this would be the montage where the hominid hero, with great effort and unwavering stamina, learns to be an irrationi. Abandoning his old habits, he tries to wedge himself into a small den, gets stuck, and the hedgehog on the inside has to push him out. (coughs) Together, they build a boy-sized den where the hero sleeps during the day, at first on his back, and then gradually revolving onto the belly. By night, 
They crawl together through the woods. <sighs> What's it like where you come from? It's like there are more right angles, walls, ceilings. The dens have more stuff in them, like showers. I guess cleaning is important. We wash our hair with shampoo. We save food in Tupperware. What? Tupperware? Tupperware is like a little container that no air enters. So if you're inside it, you stay fresh. No way. Yeah. No way, no way. Yes. No. Yes. Ah. <laughs> the reason this is not a movie is because it can't be captured on a camera. Very heartbreaking stories can break a camera lens, which is more expensive than a heart. Do I have pine needles in my back? No. Oh, it itches. He can hear his mother telling him to put arnica cream on it. She leaves messages in the abyss of his voicemail. Hi, my sweetheart. Are you hungry? Do you want some strawberries? I'm going to get groceries and they have some on sale and... Wherever you are, I could deliver them. I hope you're wearing sunscreen. Hi, my sweetheart. I ran into Greg Berkowitz, Harry's dad. He asked how kindergarten was going. I told him you were taking a gap year. I didn't know what else to call it. Hi, my sweetheart. Will you be home for Thanksgiving? These messages he won't hear. Maybe ever. I don't believe in nostalgia. It's depressing to think that everything used to be good. I try to remember the horrible things, so I know that at least things always sucked. Horrible things like what? Like, I don't know, my mom gave me a phone for my last birthday and she told me to play Angry Birds and I didn't like Angry Birds and I felt horrible. I'm not missing anything. All I'm missing is knowing that I'm being missed. Angry boys are the worst. They crawl through the night. His legs are getting shorter. His body tilts forward. The spines growing through his t-shirt are pushing his other spine forward. In this way, the two animals wander from dusk to dawn, like Ethan Hawke and Julie Delpy in Before Sunrise, and the next night like Ethan Hawke and Julie Delpy in Before Sunset. So, someone makes you lunch, and then puts it in the fridge, and you don't eat it until the next day? Yeah. And that's what goes in the Tupperware? Yeah. So, it's just sitting there for a whole night, and no one's touching it? Yeah. And it stays fresh. It's not that amazing. No, it is. You don't understand. In the winter, it's a miracle if I can find an acorn weevil. Time must be passing, but he can hardly hear it. Banded alder borer beetles are the ones with the stripes. That's why they're banded. Then you have cedar beetles, which are the ones that will bite you. The false bombardier is really, really rare, but good. Definitely worth the forage. He can't remember what month it is, or the names of months. I remember. September, uh, December, uh, uh, February, uh, uh, March, July, April, June, uh, October, uh, uh, December. You already said that one. June. I said that. November. Ha <laughs> ha! It's November! How do you know all that? Please note that children and animals know much more than we think they know. I used to live near the sleepaway camp, Camp Winnetonka. I think that was the name of it. Yeah, Camp Winnetonka. 
and all these humans would like sit around this fire pit and sing songs together. And they seemed really cozy together. Really, really cozy. So it's like, Mom, Dad, can can we have a campfire sing along? And they were all like, do you know who you are? Have we taught you nothing? They were so mad. They're sort of isolationists. Oh, yeah. They are really proud of their cultural heritage. Oh, that's cool, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Do you know any campfire sing-along songs? No. Not even one? Oh, actually, yeah, I do. <clears throat> Puff the magic dragon lives by the sea. He sang that and one. Some- I know that one. And something, 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 some in a land called on a lee. Little decade paper. Let it be known that this play is not a musical. The farther Theo walked, the less he thought about his home, his family. He tried to remember his mom's face, but all he could come up with was the dark peak of her eyebrow and the line of her lips when he hadn't done his homework. I love to go to camp when I dunk a or any camp, really. The smells of the forest were becoming stronger. Grass didn't just smell like grass. It smelled like leather and wood. Terroir of a raccoon. He always knew his perception was limited, that the world was bigger than he imagined it was, and maybe everything was made out of string. That was a theory, right? Like, my hands are actually a lot of strings? I don't see it. It's a theory. Well, they just don't look like strings. That's the point. That's why it's a theory. I don't see it. I think there are theories that say that. I think I've heard that. I think. The smells were so potent he could practically hear them. Each individual blade of grass, he could hear it move in the wind, and a chipmunk's paw patting across the ground, and the air moving back and forth at the whim of a falling leaf, or the leaf moving back and forth at the whim of the air, and rosemary and acorns, and soil mixed with cherry blossoms. It wafted toward him, a percussion of pine cones. The sounds and the smells carved out a universe more detailed than any Theo had ever known. It's like if you were a shadow and you stepped out of your 2D surface and into three dimensions. (gasps) Whoa! Whoa! Okay, whoa! That just totally blew my mind right there, you know? (laughs) That that, that totally... Whoa! (laughs) Okay, okay, okay. It's blown back together. My mind is blown back together. (laughs) You're a shadow? No, I feel like a shadow. I should take you to meet my family. You know that? I think they'd like you. I really think they'd love you. My mom loves intellectuals. Oh, that'd be cool. Hey, look it. There's a sign. What's it say? Cul-de-sac. What's that? Bottom of the bag. Is that the house you came from? The light's on upstairs. He can hear his mom turning pages on her Kindle. Pages turn faster and faster. What? No. Maybe they have Tupperware. Come on. I'll wait for you out here. Come on. I don't like to dress pass. You nervous. Don't be such a human. I'm not being a human. They crawl onto the welcome mat where a stripe of light shines from under the door, revealing the fraying edge of a red carpet. The hedgehog, which one I don't remember, crawls under the mat for a spare key and climbs the screen door like an iguana until he reaches the lock. He bites a hole through the screen and fits in the key. Shh! I didn't say anything you did. I said shh! You said something again! An old smell. Like a new car or vacuum cleaner exhaust. They crawl down the hall, into the kitchen, his hand as if being led by another hand opens the drawers. 
the cutlery, the pots and pans, the saran wrap, and here. Is that? A Tupperware. That's an actual Tupperware? I want to go inside it. Be quick. Close the top. You won't have any air. I can hold my breath for a while. It's fine. I'll give you the signal when I feel fresh. I don't know what is the moral of this tale. Why the ticking clock so closely aligns with the hedgehog's heart. Why the one has to die for the other to function as a member of his species. Why have I told this story like it's a fable when there's no moral? I don't know. I buried the Tupperware in a flower pot, then went upstairs to bed and fell asleep on my belly. You just heard Lily Ackerman's Hedgehog Years, directed by Judith Ivey. Performances by Jeremy Seamus as Theo and Carol Kane as the Hedgehog. Special thanks to Josie Merck for making this play possible. Thank you, everybody. That was great. Hedgehog Years opens with the sound of ticks and talks and Theo's line. He tries to listen to the moment between two moments. Can you talk? about the ways this play is about time. Do you want to start, Lily? Sure, yeah. I think I started it when I had a deadline coming up, and it was very oppressive. So part of it was just wishing I could stop thinking about the future or somehow ignore a deadline. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) Unexpectedly practical answer. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. Right. But also a deadline as in the feeling of the future that you have as a human and you maybe don't have if you're a different kind of animal as acutely. Mm -hmm. Although maybe you do. I don't know. Um, (laughs) So I think that led to him wanting to be a hedgehog. At one point in the play, the sound of TikTok becomes raindrops. Was that to suggest that time has stopped for the boy in any way? Yeah, because he's entering the hedgehog world, and the clocks are far away. Right. Do you think awareness of the passing of time has anything to do with the the passage Theo, in a sense, goes through from early childhood, that kind of a consciousness, to another kind of a mindset that an adult deals with? Maybe, although I feel like I was a stressed out kid, sort of. So, But I think that kids can be pretty aware of the passage of time, too. And I think as a kid, I was aware that I was supposed to be less aware of it also. Like that there was an assumption from adults that as a kid, you're not supposed to care about. It's, it's just you're innocent and it's a great time. But maybe that relates to the idea of nostalgia and how he's suspicious of it because I don't think that kids are necessarily unaware of time. Who knows, right? Yeah, who knows? Yeah. I remember as a, as a little girl just being obsessed with death. Like if my mom was five minutes late coming back from the supermarket, you know, I was absolutely mm. certain that she was dead. And, and, and I guess that... I, I, are you telling me I wasn't supposed to be? No, that's... <laughs> that's the fact. And I thought as a child, oh my, this is endless. This day's never going to end, uh, especially in summer, because then you weren't in school. And how did you fill up your day? It wasn't uh, the clock ticking at all, except that it was t- ticking so slowly. And now, at the ripe old age of hum hum that I am, it seems like the clock is just speeding by, you know, mm. the, which is the way adults always talked about it. I think there's something. There's something innocent about learning about time and death, like what Carol was saying, that you can become you become more obsessed with it almost than an adult sometimes because you're like you realize like everything's gonna die, we're all gonna die, time's moving, like anything could happen. Like you said, my mom is gonna die. So I think 
the play kind of feels like it reflects some of that too, like the older Theo thinking about how the younger Theo thought about time and the clock ticking and mm -hmm. the universe expanding. And mm -hmm. Theo mentions heartbreak in his story. He says hearts are cheaper than camera lenses. Can you all talk about heartbreak as you see it in Lily's story? Want to start with Lily? I think uh, there's a heartbreak of not being able to live as a hedgehog. And also for the hedgehog, he can't get so close to the human world. And the choice that we're, we're forced to make in a way to live in society. And then the sacrifices that that necessitates is a heartbreak. Yeah, I think any story to me that's about like the loss of childhood you know like the end of the Winnie the Pooh books or any time that's like you have to say goodbye to childhood things which actually is what Puff the Magic Dragon is about too it's always just it's always heartbreaking to to sort of have to not be a kid and not even because kids actually are so innocent or like like Lily said like it's not that kids don't think about time and death but it's still like the loss of childhood is is just a tragedy. It's, it happens to everyone, so it's life's tragedy. Having two children who are grown-ups, I can think back to various moments when they were no longer going to let me hold them or sit on my lap or my son had a thing where he played with your earlobes and when that went away it was just so sad to me and I think that's what I tapped into when I first read this was his the sadness of the the mature Theo facing that he couldn't have all those things again I mean just the tiniest things I share the joy of Tupperware with the hedgehog. I think Tupperware is the one of the great inventions of the 20th century. <laughs> so we've mentioned heartbreak, but can you talk also, all of you, about the comedy in Lily's piece? Well, I just think it's inherently funny that a hedgehog is the teacher to this young boy. You know, out of all the animals you could have picked, I and mean, it's a hedgehog. I just think that's Inherent, it's even funny to say hedgehog. Anyone else? Carol. Well, I, I was. I'm back on heartbreak. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of comedy, <laughs> um, because <clears throat> it's interesting, Judy. You say the hedgehog is the teacher, but then at the end of it, due to a complete hope, a runaway hope. And runaway innocence, there's a death. There's the death of the hedgehog due to hope and innocence. So anyway, to me, that's the heartbreak. And, and I suppose um, the joy, the joy, and then the cutting off of the joy, you know. Well, and it so wonderfully parallels the, the youth yeah. and then the grown-up version. And even though the hedgehog seems to have all this wisdom about the hedgehog about, world about, about the hedgehog but then in the human world knows nothing is just as innocent as Theo is of the hedgehog world so this plays also about imagination seems to me I mean it's imagination is the linchpin of theater even more so in audio theater can any of you talk about the role of imagination in this play Oh, my goodness. Well, I think I just... The imagination of Lily Ackerman is pretty yes. uh, um, vast, yeah. I would say. And uh, the way she captured and took them on this little journey, right down to the fact that he wasn't there for Thanksgiving, which just always grabbed me the first time I read it. Just all the elements of missing out on a family you know, traditional holiday down to the hedgehog went on a date and the the date only wants salad. And <laughs> it's, I mean, it's just, it just tumbles and tumbles and tumbles. Uh, you're a fascinating writer. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thanks. Lily chose a hedgehog um, for this play. 
What animal companion would your imaginations have chosen? Well, I uh, I guess because I'm given my childhood, it would be in the forest. I guess I, I would imagine a deer, mm. you know, a kind of Bambi huh. creature. Yeah. But, you know, a hedgehog's more interesting, really. They're really think. cute. They're, they, they are cute. They're, you know, and uh, and the fact that they're bristly and therefore in a strange way, not lovable, not huggable, you know, that I liked, yeah. mm-hmm. that that spoke to me, that you pick someone, but say I'd go pick a deer and hang mm-hmm. on its neck and wait for it to let me ride it or something, I don't know. For me, it's a dog, but it's the same. Well, I think Theo and the Hedgehog are both very independent. Thank you all, Lily Ackerman, our playwright, Carol Kane, who played the Hedgehog, Jeremy Seamus, who played Theo. And Judith Ivey, who directed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. You've been listening to Playing On Air. Associate producer, Michelle O'Brien. Literary manager, Bonnie Antosh. Theme and play music, Tom Cochan. Recording and sound design, John Kilgore. Audio editing, Julia Melfi. Playing On Air is distributed by PRX. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can visit us at playingonair.org, where you can discover new shorts and interviews with amazing artists. Subscribe to Playing On Air on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And to help us share great theater with new listeners nationwide, rate and review a show. It's the best way to spread the word. For Playing On Air, I'm your host, Claudia Catania. Thanks for listening. Thank you.